So, good morning. And <coughs> seem to have solved the technical problem with the projector. So, yeah, my name is Oliver Ragnarthron, and I would like to briefly introduce you to our operational weather forecasting system, which we acronym WHAT, Weather on Demand, and uh, has been in development within our company for more or less in 2011 and is a, a spin-off project of a on-demand service that we developed for the search and rescue sector called SAR Weather and I'll, I'll show you a little bit on of the SAR Weather later on. But uh, so the outline of this talk is is the basic uh, design philosophy of the WOT system with a brief description of, of the current hardware configuration. Uh, for example, this will be the uh, configuration that will be installed here in the Seychelles. And then an overview of, of the WOT system itself, followed by a step-by-step -step demonstration of how to set up routine forecast in the WOT system. And by past experience, I've learned not to do live demonstrations when doing talks. It's usually something fails if you do that. But we'll be running a, a live forecast on the SAR weather system to show you how that works. And then I'll also give you some examples of uh, what we call the post-processing possibilities within the system and, and then uh, a brief summary. So <clears throat> the design philosophy of the WOT system, uh, it's, it's tricky or impossible to describe it in, in one slide. But it uh, embraces the open source philosophy. And uh, this makes it possible for us to, to update and, and scale out and also deploy without having to worry about licensing fees. So, so we are not using uh, software modules that are proprietary within the, within the design. Uh, we are using um, scientific libraries from the NumPy Python family. And the software is run on clusters of, of Linux machines. We are using Postgres, SQL, and uh, NGINX web services. And uh, importantly, the system code is event-driven. Uh, this means that processes wait until they get an event from an external source before they do any kind of, of processing at all. And uh, that means they don't have to wait until we are certain of a certain process can take place because we know exactly when the conditions for said process to take place are, are fulfilled. And an example of this would be uh, the um, running of the ungrip process that we described yesterday. We cannot run ungrip before we are certain that the file from the GFS server is for a certain in our file system. And this is even driven when the file from the GFS server is in place, there's an event, meaning that the second process, which is ungrip, can take place. And then when ungrip has finished, there's a new event, and the metgrid process can start. So it's, it's event driven in that way. And this also means that the, the throughput can be added as needed to handle uh, increased workloads. Um, here's a schematic of, of the current hardware configuration. We have a, uh, the machine is, is connected to the internet or, or, the, or the firewall of the institution through a, a typical one gigabit uh, switch. Um, here you can see the list of the virtual machines that we are deploying. There's actually one virtual machine more there. But one is for the what we call the WOT system itself. This is the main, main workhorse. Here we have a, a service machines to handle the DNS the, um, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, here we have the virtual machine that handles the um, web server or web service for uh, visualizing the post-processing output. And here we have what we call a trigger, which is also used for, um, I'll describe the trigger in more detail later on, but it's used to do kind of a on-the-site post-processing, so it's not directly linked to the watt system. 
And then, of course, over here we have a, a 10 gigabit uh, Ethernet switch that connects the uh, computing nodes to the water machine. So all data transfer uh, from the computing nodes to the master node is, is via 10 gigabit, dedicated 10 gigabit Ethernet. And the nodes themselves are interconnected through an infiniband um, switch. So the computations over the cluster are um, go over the infiniband network, but the data throughput, data I/O goes through the uh, 10 gig Ethernet. <coughs> and here's just a, a photograph of the uh, of the clusters. Um, this machine here is now hopefully being uh, cleared of customs <laughs> here in Seychelles. So here we have the compute nodes. This is a, a 2U unit with four 16-core uh, in, uh, Intel cores. So in here we have 64 computing cores of the latest, latest Intel version 3 design. And in here we have, have the disk array and uh, a 12 core machine that handles all, 24 core machine that handles all the uh, virtual machines and, and the data post processing. And somewhere in here you have the uh, 10 gigabit switch and the infinite band switch. And there's also a, a small switch for the ILO uh, connection so that even if the machine goes down, we can still have access to it to the ELO uh, network for diagnostic and, and hopefully uh, to reboot it and, and etc. <coughs> Sorry. Um, <coughs> here's a schematic of the main components of the of the what system. And you can see there are uh, many lines going back and forth with, with different colors. And, uh, and in the middle, you have a, have a kind of a, a spider in its web, what we call the conductor. And the uh, coloring coding of the line is such that the, the red lines or the red arrows indicate that data is being written. So we have, for example, here, the conductor has a red line to the job metadata and task queue, which means that the, the conductor is, is writing to these uh, uh, parts of the database. And green lines mean that data is being read. And we can also see that the conductor is, is in turn also reading information from the task queue and the job metadata uh, uh, database, and also from the scheduled jobs. And then we have the blue lines, and they represent messages being sent. And these boxes here, the, these two model and plotter, they show uh, individual uh, tasks within the watch system. And the cylinders here, called database and file system, <coughs> they are databases. And, and to the left, we have the what's called the meta database. And to the right, there is a, a shared file system database. So the main difference is that as this database here has uh, just the metadata and, and is a, a low cost uh, and with lim uh, not, much, not much data in it. But in here, we have uh, like the static data from the USGS, all the terrain data, land use data. Here we have the GFS forecasts that are being uh, downloaded four times a day. Here we have the output from the model itself and, and then the post-processing plot. So this, this file system here gets big quite quickly. So we, we also have means of scrubbing it or, or cleaning it out regularly. So we don't end up with an exponential growth of data and, and uh, filling up a disk system and uh, basically being in a bad place. Um, <clears throat> now there are other boxes that, yeah, the, the sorry, the boxes down here, the model and plotter, they are um, basically components of the watch system that are performing specific tasks, such as running the weather model, which, which you call the modeler, modeler, and and creating the the plots or the charts, which is called the, the plotter. 
And uh, up here we have what we call the GFS fetcher, which is responsible for fetching or, or collecting the uh, GFS data, which we use for uh, initial and, and uh, boundary data for, for the model. Um, and this cloud here will be, I'll show it more cl clearly later on, but it's uh, basically external services that can communicate with the conductor. For example, the API system where we initiate new jobs, for instance. That would be represented by this cloud here. But this is the kind of the, the core system of the of the what forecasting forecasting system. So here may regard this as a kind of a, a zoomed out figure. We still have the, the databases with the conductor. Uh, but now we have, remember, the, the cloud outside. This would be one part of that cloud and, and also this uh, rapid message queuing here. And here we have the API that's controlling. It's, it's through the API that we initiate new forecasts and, and also play or work on, on part of the database here, changing it. And it's through the API that we can let all the web clients access uh, weather charts, for example. So uh, the, the plots we create for the Seychelles, you could actually, with a kind of maybe 15 lines of HTML code, you could embed these forecasts into whatever for, uh, web website you have. And that would be handled by the API guy here. Um, <coughs> sorry, the uh, contractor also notifies the job progress through a, a rabbit message queue, and this message queue then interacts with the with the trigger machine, that then can execute new uh, post processing tasks. And example of these tasks would be creation of of point forecasts conversion of these point forecasts to XML data formats that can then be read by uh, high charts software where you can have a, a kind of a live feeling of, of the data. Uh, another possibility for post processing here would be to create uh, skew T diagrams important for, for airport forecasts. And, and basically all kind of additional post-processing tasks. And, and this is kind of, in a way, it's intentionally, it's, it's a bit decoupled from the forecasting system itself. So what I mean by that is things can go wrong here without affecting the forecasting system itself. So you, you might have a, a disk failure in the machine that's handling the post-processing, but that would not harm the, the raw processing of the forecast themselves. So it's a, it's a coupled system, but it's not too coupled. Uh, <clears throat> now, setting up type of forecast, the simplest way to do it is to log on to the API and set it up through the web interface. And what I'm showing you here is are things that are kind of inherited from the SAR weather system, which I'll show you later on. So you log on to the uh, secure server, typically HTTPS what dot some social Met Office, whatever we have, and you then choose to submit a job. And then you have a, I'm not sure you can see it, but you, you get a kind of a, it's not very fancy, but it's descriptive. Uh, we usually keep this reference empty. Here in title, it's good to put something descriptive like Seychell test one or, and then you have the center longitude, center, center latitude and center longitude of the, of the forecast. And I think this example was for, is from, from when we were in, in Cabo Verde last September. So 
14.7 to 5 north, uh, 17.5 west. I think we are centered around around the Seychelles, uh, around the Cabo Verde, sorry. And in start, I uh, usually just keep that empty because it, then it's by default now. And in length, if we're just testing, it's sufficient to set six, meaning six hour forecast. We're just, you know, we're just setting up a domain and seeing that everything is working. And then what you call type is you can choose from a predefined list of forecast types. And uh, okay, we have dark blue on a light blue background. So that's can you can you see can you read anything here? Can you see it? No. Okay. <laughs> Basically what you're seeing is a list of that goes something like large dot one, large dot three, large dot nine, medium dot one, medium dot three, medium dot nine, and then small dot one, small dot three, small dot nine. I mean large mean you have a large, you know, big domain and dot th one, one kilometer. Dot three, you have a three kilometer resolution. Dot nine, you have a nine kilometer resolution. And then medium, small, this is the same. And then we have uh, something we call volcano. Das medium, dot nine, this is a, a setup for a, a volcanic dispersion forecast. And a number of others like Bergen, dot one. It's, it's a customized domain that we've been running for the Bergen area in, in Western Norway for many, many years. And but these are, are these are lists, and within each um, within each um, directory, you have a list of four files, which are basically um, YAML files that can are then that are then turned into the what we call the namelist.vps and namelist input files. So, simplest way to create a new forecast type is just to go through this list of what's there. Find something that's closest to your needs, create a new directory, copy all the files into it, and modify them accordingly. Either by changing the, the domain size. Uh, by default, all, all domains are, are centered at the same, same location. So if you want to set up a, a domain like Joe did uh, yesterday, where the nested domain was not actually in the center of the last domain, you would need to do those modifications in, in within the um, uh, within one of these files that you are, have copied. So, but they are basically templates to create the nameless WS, WPS, and the nameless input files. <coughs> so, once we have done this, um, we run the model and then we have the option of, of clicking map to see see the outline of the map and, and that's where the uh, plots will be re represented and if we are happy about what we see this is what we see this is the first we have not we just started running the model we have not started creating any, any plots so it would take maybe three or four minutes to get the first first plots here but if we are happy with our results, we can can go back and press schedule, which means that we want to we are happy with this configuration, and we want to make a, a routine job out of this. Uh, period length means that we want to do a 24-hour forecast, and what we call period offset is that it means that we want to skip the first three hours of the model. So we we don't want to be plotting the first three hours of, of the forecast. So we kind of regard this as a, a spin-up period and we not don't quite trust the output from the model. And, <coughs> and then we this is, is just a snapshot of, of the result there. So oops If you want to, yeah, here, here we have, by default, we are plotting uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight types of plots. So we have uh, 
low clouds, total cloud cover, uh, what you call a composite, where we have precipitation and, and, and winds. And then accumulated precipitation. Uh, <clears throat> now there's snow, which might not be necessary here. Wind and wind chill, which also might be, and, and temperature, of course. So you quite, you might want to go into the database and change which plots you're creating. Uh, for example, uh, I would not be wasting CPU power in plotting snow or wind chill either. Uh, instead, you might be plotting um, winds and turbulence at different height levels. But that might be one option. <coughs> so there's, there's a number of predefined plots you can create. And, um, and these can be uh, added on as well. I think just Carolina just recently uh, on a request from one of our customers, added uh, six new types of, of vertical plots for, for aviation. So, but <clears throat> so this was part of the, the kind of the tightly knit what system. But we also had this what you call the triggers, where you can do uh, more kind of customized. Post-processing based on maybe just one type. You have say okay. You say you have four types of forecasts going on, but there's only one where you need to do something extra for the customer, like like presenting here data that can be used for TV news on on, on the weather, and that's that will be done through the trigger. And in this particular example, we are yeah. Here's here's the again just remind you where we are. And, and also, you can set, convert the, the ASCII files for the point forecast into an XML format to, to be plotted with something like the high charts code. Um, the XML format that we have adapted is an exact replica of the XML format used by the Norwegian Met Office on their web yr.no, yr.no, if, if you're familiar with that one. So it it's means that if you have a code that can read our XML and plot it, you also have a code that can access the uh, vast database on, on yr.no and plot that as well. And EAR.NO for this region is putting out point forecast from the ECNWF model. So that might be a, a source of useful source of, of forecast and information for you. And this is just an example of, of how to present uh, an example of how, how the, these XML files can be plotted. Uh, so, to summarize, and, and after this summary, I'll, I'll show you a little bit on, on the SAR weather system and then go in more detail into the uh, individual modules that I was talking about. So, <clears throat> we can use the WOT system to, to create conventional short to medium range weather forecasts. Uh, medium range, I would say, up to 10 days. And basically for any location on the globe. And it's based on open source components. It's even driven. It's very scalable and, and resilient. Uh, and the output can be used as, as input into all the decision support software. So I would say from ICPAC point of view, for example, we could use the trigger part of the system for to create, say, extract a number of variables from our WARF output file for a certain region and put that on an FTP server where ICPAC or UNOSAT could then access this data and use it to run their hydrological runoff model to make assessment of, of flooding risks in, in various regions. So that's one example of how to use the trigger. Another example was to create these point forecasts and convert them to XML for, uh, for viewing. 
Um, yeah, and, and we are currently use, doing forecasts for, for Cabo Verde, Mauritius, Guinea-Bissau, Seychelles, and actually we are missing Africa there. We are, uh, started the Pan-Africa model, and Seychelles, of course, should be there. I should have updated the slides. That's a silly, <laughs> silly mistake. <laughs> so, uh, now for the SAR weather. So the SAR weather system is, is a web-based on-demand forecasting tool. And it was designed for serve the needs of search and rescue operators, initially in, in Iceland, but then also for the GTAX consortium. And once you've logged on, you press this request new forecast button. And we are in business. Uh, it's a very slow computer, so we should soon have a map of, yeah, if it doesn't know where we are, it defaults to, yeah, it defaults to the central peak of Eyjafjallajökull, which was the cause of the aviation havoc in, in Europe in 2010. So, uh, it wants to know a location, yes. And then hopefully it should place us in the right, yeah, we're here. So, <coughs> we can, trying to choose from Three types of resolution, one, three, or nine kilometer, and each resolution has three sizes of, of domains. So this would be forecast type medium dot one. That's a, it's a medium sized medium sized domain at a one kilometer resolution. So this is it's from this system that the forecast types list comes from. Uh, we can also do a, a nine kilometer, a large domain. So, but just to show you quickly how it works, we'll go for a, oh, go for a medium one kilometer resolution. And try to zoom in here. Where are we? And you can see the, the red box here. It's actually one by one grid cell. So this is the, the Lego cube we thought, talked about yesterday. So this is the mesh size of a grid. So we can centralize it here and uh, trying to and do a Six hour forecast. And this computer is really not my friend. Oh, great. That's okay, I need to give it a title, so call it Mahe Tess. And then it does not want to do. And we can also choose to have aviation plots, so we have them slightly more, more plots. And yeah, we are choosing to start from 10 UTC last night to 4, so that's, that's okay, doesn't matter. And then we start the forecast. And what's happening now is that in somewhere in on the east coast of the US in an Amazon cloud server, a, a new machine is being started. And at the same time, we have another machine that's now going through the ungrip and, and met grid and all that processes. And soon the computing machine will be up and, up and about and will start running the forecast. 
and we'll be updated regularly on this, on, on the process of, of the simulation. So in the meantime, this, so we should, yeah, okay, preparing weather data. Uh, we are only doing um, six hour forecast, but we also do a kind of a, a spin up period. So it's you're using uh, one, two, three GFS files. So six hours before, on the hour, and then after six hours. So now it's doing the, the ungrip and, and mass grid process. And now it's start, finished it and has started simulating and calculating the forecast. And soon, yeah, now it's the start of the weather model. And we should expect uh, eight figures or eight, eight time slices. And soon we should see the first first figure. And this is this features this feature is also in the watt system. That it meaning that you start seeing new model output as soon as it's ready. You don't have to wait until the whole simulation is done to see the see the plots. And which is nice if say for example for the ten day forecast we are running for, for all of Africa. It takes almost six hours on on the 256 core cluster that we have, but you start seeing the new data as as soon as it's ready. But if we continue with with our description of the um, what system uh, slightly more in detail, and here's a, a example or, or schematic of the job metadatabase. It's as I said it's this is the small database. It's, it's searchable to SQL commands, and it has a certain uh, hierarchy, where where you start with a schedule, then you have a individual jobs, individual jobs have individual domains, and individual domains have individual plot sets, and this hierarchy is then con it's interconnected through through IDs, and then job IDs. So the ID of the job is called the job ID of the domain, and the ID of the domain is called the domain ID of the plot set. And this is important to keep in mind when you go to change, for example, the plot types. You need to be able to trace back from the schedule, through the job, through the domain, to the domain ID, through the correct plot set for the prototype job you just created. And it's it is not trivial, and but with time, and and you have to test it. You have to try it yourself. With time, you, you get more confident in both adding new plot types, or, or preferably also creating new, completely new plot types, customized to your needs. And so, so it's important to to start working with the um, SQL database. And you also have to be very careful when you're doing it because it's so easy to mess things up. Uh, the most important command I learned was begin <laughs> and roll back. Please, if you're doing, making changes to the database, start by doing begin, do your changes, see if it works, then you can commit. Otherwise, do roll back. And start again. And as I said, changes can be done. Uh, you can change the entries in the metadatabase using standard SQL commands like update, schedule, set, period length. Here we are changing the uh, forecast length of a certain certain forecast. So this is a, a two domains. So this is forecast. Two days is, is the forecast length of our outer domain, and two days of the inner domain as well. And this is where the proto this is the prototype ID of of the forecast. Uh, we can also expire the uh, the forecast if we don't want it to run anymore. We can expire it, and that's done through a a, a parameter called. LT analysis, last triggered analysis. 
or we can also this basically yeah, expires equals last trigger analyst or we can also give a, a full um, data string of, of yeah full full data date string sorry um, Another component, important component, was the GFS fetcher, the software tool that retrieves the GFS global forecast. Uh, you can both retrieve the whole forecast for the whole globe, or you can make a, a partial part of the globe. And you can choose if, whether you collect the 0.5 data set or the 0.25. And again, this is something you need to test just to see if, if the bandwidth where you are is, is sufficient to support the 0.25. If it's not, switch to the 0.5 degree data set. You can try to large it, make it smaller. It is something you have to, have to try. Um, typically, data starts arriving about three and a half hour or four hours after the uh, analysis time. So for the midnight analysis from the GFS uh, UTC, we can start retrieving the data three and a half to four hours later. And again, the GFS fetcher notifies which states are, are available. And this means that the conductor starts forecasts accordingly. So if we have, say for Pan-Africa, we have a 10-day forecast and we cannot start the forecast until all the input data have arrived. But in, in our other operational system, we have, say, a 24-hour forecast for the Seychelles and we also have a seven-day forecast for Iceland which means that we can actually start the one-day Seychelles forecast long before the seven-day forecast for Iceland because after maybe 25, 30 minutes, we have the first 24 hours of the global forecast, meaning we can start a one-day forecast. And the GFS FED series is launched via Cron, and as I said, it's, it sends the incremental progress to the conductor which then a set starts jobs accordingly. So long jobs, they start later. Short jobs, you can start them earlier. Um, yeah, here's again, sorry, this is a, a. Uh, the schedule records. Uh, it's in the schedule record that it, you have information on, on when a forecast should be uh, launched. Uh, you can also have you can have a very flexible way of deciding when to run the forecast. You don't have to run the forecast every six hours. You can say, okay, this type of forecast, I only want to initiate it based on the midnight analysis on Thursdays. You can you can build up a complex hierarchy of, of forecast that way. And the, the um, schedule also links to the, what they call the prototype job, which was the one we created initially, and to the last completed and last triggered jobs. So it has a, a, it knows when it was triggered and it knows when it finished. Now the job records, uh, this is more of a, a metadata about a, a single forecast. And within it, you can, to a certain extent, uh, set up a, a priority for the forecast. So a, a low priority forecast you can, which will then wait in the queue until a higher priority forecast finishes. And there you have also the job type, specifying which model setups and dimensions. Um, you have the domains there and the domains usually contain the plot sets. Both the region, plot types, and, and, and plot sizes. By plot sizes, we mean the uh, pixel sizes of the PNG figures. Um, typically, we plot 
each chart in two to three uh, resolutions, uh, meaning pixel pixel wise resolutions, because you can actually zoom in and out of the plots through the, using the API. So when you zoom in, you eventually come into a higher resolution figure, and it's also important for. Um, uh, because there's a certain uh, intelligence in the web server based on your screen size. If you're on a mobile device, you'll be you'll be viewing a, a, the smallest version of, of the figure. But if you're on a huge screen, you'll you'll get the big pixel size figure. Now the conductor, you know, the remember the the spider at the center of the web. This is the central component of the system. Yes. Can you go to the previous slide? To the previous slide. No. This one. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what I wanted to ask is, say you have a launching job, right? And you want to archive the, your forecast. So where where do you archive your forecast? Now, uh, that's not all. Say if you want to also compare your forecast for a particular one, is a previous one, how do you do that? Uh, archiving is done, so what, what the system does is it creates, in the file system, it creates a new directory, which has a, a date string and then a, a, a scrambled string. And it's within this directory that the whole uh, MATEM files, the input files and the WARF out files are created and stored. And, but there's a, a cleaning up process that usually cleans up the WARF out files after two or three days. But if you want to store them permanently, that's something you would use the trigger to do. Uh, for, for example, in, in Iceland, we are storing the WARF output files from our, our uh, seven day forecast, and we do that through the trigger. So the trigger basically goes to the directory and copies the WARF out file to a permanent storage. So that's the way you would archive the data. Um, to compare the yesterday forecast with today's forecast, I think, again, you would do that through the triggering mechanism. You can either do it by, are you thinking about viewing the various point forecasts or, or the, or the uh, charts. Charts. That's slightly more, yes, because you have access to to the charts, but that would also, re yeah, you'd need to do some coding in the trigger to, you know, to retain the string, full, full string to the uh, to the forecast through the API system. So it's yeah. because the yeah yeah the charts are stored, but the the link to them is is non-trivial. But you'd have to yeah you'd have to write a script in the trigger to uh, make a list of of the link to the to the past charts. So it's uh, yeah, it's it's something we have not done, but we have a pretty good idea how to do it. Yeah. Uh, say you want to do some post analysis. Uh, so can that be possible also to launch post analysis? And also, as uh, we learned yesterday, if you also want to do verification of how the model is performing this ground truth data. So for that, you also need uh, historic uh, observations, observations and, and forecasts. And forecast, yeah. yeah. The model. So how do you Ka Carolina will be covering that in the next lecture. But in, in principle, that's also part of the trigger. It's, it's the trigger where you add these um, customized tools. And they are actually, yes, as the name implies, what the trigger does is is triggered by events from the forecasting system. 
So you could say when a Mauritius point one forecast is done, we run this script, this script, this script to create the post, post we, we do the uh, point forecasts, we convert them to XML, we store them in a database, uh, we move the uh, raw output file to permanent storage, we might even do a, a some, maybe you don't want to move the whole file, but just to extract surface variables or, or some uh, most important variables so you don't end up with a, a 50 gigabyte file but then rather you have one gigabyte file. Uh, all, all of this would be done in the trigger trigger phase. And, and as I said, Carolina will be uh, describing the what you call the Weather Hills database that handles the, the observations and, and the point forecast. I think I have I have some slides to, to show that. So, but yeah, with, with the conductor, this is basically the the core of the system, <coughs> and and here we have have the model data. What happens to the model data? It's it lives in the wild system, and the, these are lots. Yeah, the 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 file system has has the configure files for each model run and, and also the large static files. And this is where the uh, global weather data is, is stored and the model output and the images or, or charts. And you can locate this from the job metadata, but it's not, not easily searchable. That's because we have, have a, we have the, the um, file system where the output files are stored are based on the time when the forecast is initiated and then you have a, a scrambled string afterwards. So it's a database directory structure and, and a directory for its, its job. So, but again, as I mentioned, we'll now talk a bit more about the triggers. And they are connected by a rapid message queue message bus and you can run them remotely, uh, meaning that they are not directly connected to the watch system. And they are unable to interfere with the core system processing. So if, if something crashes in the triggering process, it's not going to affect the watch system itself. And one problem is that if, if the trigger goes down, then it requests queue up. So uh, yeah, that's one thing you have to be careful about not to end up with a, with a large backlog of, uh, of processes or requests. And this is where you run custom processes when jobs are completed, either to create specialized plots or point forecasts or, or basically custom reports for industry like uh, for uh, wind energy sector. This is where you would be creating customized output files to serve the wind, wind energy sector or the hydrological energy sector as, as we are doing in Iceland. Um, and you can also use this to, to trigger another job. So when, when a job is finished in a trigger, you can use that as a trigger to start another job. Uh, example of this is where we create a, a point forecast. When that is done, there's a trigger and this trigger starts the conversion of set point forecast to an XML format. Mm. And, and here through the trigger you also have access to the uh, model output. So as I said, one thing we do through the trigger is to copy the WARF output files to permanent storage or to some, do something else with it if you, if you want. We also use the trigger system to extract a certain set of data that are necessary for uh, the operation of, of a runoff model 
for the hydrological sector in Iceland. So this is this is we do it in the triggering process. And they look basically you control the triggers through uh, a YAML file, which has looks something like this. Um, here you have a, a job that we call Eastland 3 Backup. And this is backing up Warford files for domains 1 and 2 from the Iceland grid forecast. And it's very hard to see what says there. You have some keys here that, that are using the trigger, so it's a jobs from Opera. And job Opera does Eastland does 3. Uh, model date, model done. So it basically when when this model uh, when this forecast is, is finished, the this command here is executed, and this command is simply secure copy then the string to the to the forecast output, and we copy this to a another uh, destination. And this command could also be a, a bus script that does more specific job. And so the, the structure of this is fairly simple. And here's a, yeah, a more, more examples of these. Here's here where we are doing the point forecasts. We have the analysis, we have input, and this is fed into this just a script called pf.shell. Um, you're doing, yeah, this is just a number of examples how you can play with the trigger. And yeah, this is. One example of, of outputs we are, are are making, and and this was another example. This is a high charts code that's accessing accessing uh, XML forecast, and, and again the XML format, and I think that's pretty much the end of what I wanted to say. This. Uh, and just to take the last few slides to go through a what you call a job life cycle. We, we start by fetching two days worth of, of data and it's continuously sent a message to the conductor. Um, the conductor sees that a schedule record needs 48 hours of global weather data. It clones the prototype job with the updated data fields. Uh, it creates a model task for the job and puts in the queue. The model task waits until you have sufficient CPU power or resources to start it. Um, and then you have a request from a, a modeler machine and requesting a task. And then the task is uh, given to the, uh, to the modeler. And the conductor again is notified that a, a modeling task has started or a forecast, you start to create a forecast. And then the conductor starts creating plot tasks for each plot set from which we have defined. And uh, in one of the virtual machines you have, have a, a list of worker processes that are doing the plotting. And basically each plot task waits until, until you have a worker that is capable of doing it. And then that again is communicated back and forth to the conductor. And this information on which plots are ready is then fed to the web server so it knows when to put in a new new plot. And and this is repeated over and over and over until the whole whole forecast is done. And then the job is marked completed and the schedule is, is updated accordingly with the new last completed job. So this is a schematic trying to show this. Um, this is something we created, say the prototype job we created a long time ago. Then you have a, a schedule that's triggering the job. We have here, this forecast has, has two domains and two separated plot sets, but a, a single model run. And you can see here is that uh, 
you have model output, then you have uh, plots. And actually you can, when the forecast itself is done, the job is not necessarily done. You need to finish plotting. And it's not until all the plots are finished that the job is listed as done. So that was the last slide on this brief introduction to the watch system. So thank you very much.